I'd like to introduce the final session of today in which Ian Waterworth, Technology and Operations Director, will explore how as a service can unlock opportunities for capital markets with our partner, DXC Luxon. Ian, over to you. Thanks, Emmanuel, for a very interesting discussion on fostering an innovative and digital resilient EU financial sector. And welcome everyone to the final session of the day on how as a service can unlock opportunities for capital markets. Today, we have a half hour for this fireside discussion and please consider and post any questions in the live discussion, which we'll get to at the end of the session. In the business world where we're constantly look, looking to innovate and positively impact the capital markets value chain as a service is evolving and, and playing an increasingly bigger role. Today, I'm joined by Ihedin El Fiki, Global Head Trading and Risk Management Solutions at DXC Luxoft. Yeah, Dean, I welcome you to introduce yourself and, and be great to um, offer, if you could offer some background uh, for our audience on DXC Looks Up. Excellent. Yeah, thank you, uh, Ian, uh, for giving me this opportunity. So, um, uh, DXC Larsoft, we are a digital strategy and uh, software engineering uh, global company. So, we specialize in financial services. Uh, our banking and capital market practice is about 6,000 people working in 42 uh, countries. Uh, I'm myself in charge of the department we call trading and risk solutions so that's a group of 1000 people working on a set of software packages um, uh, mainly driven by murex where we are the largest operator of murex uh, in the world yeah so happy to be here with you today fantastic um okay so we're going to jump straight into our first uh topic and and the question i have for you is what are the key challenges you see facing the capital markets business today yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. And actually, uh, uh, our clients come and ask this uh, question all the time. They're trying to understand what's driving the dynamic uh, in, the, uh, you know, in the banking sector. And we have been observing the, our clients and uh, the banking sector in general for the last uh, 15, 20 years. The main, the main driver for uh, especially the digitalization and, and the, the new, uh, you know, the, the strategic transformations are the return on capital. Yeah, it's like any company, banks need to, uh, to improve their uh, profitability. And that has been put under pressure uh, all the time, actually, and iteratively because of, uh, on the cost side, uh, mainly driven by more complex operations, uh, a higher cost of running uh, uh, applications, um, uh, also, you know, investment in, in terms of capital to address some of the re regulatory uh, requirements. On the revenue side as well, uh, there's some challenges in terms of um, uh, there's more standardization uh, uh, in terms of products. Uh, so they become more vanilla, uh, the less volumes, uh, reduced margins uh, because of, uh, you know, electronic uh, trading, etc. So profitability is one of those uh, elements that comes all the time uh, in the discussions. The, the second one is uh, skills management. So we need to understand that banks for the last 15, 20 years have built or have select either built bespoke solutions or also acquired software packages. They come uh, with different technologies, different niche skills. Uh, uh, most of the time, different regions or entities of the bank will select different software packages for different desks or different, uh, you know, on the front office, on the back office, and the risk, uh, et cetera. So we, they end now with a constellation of, uh, of bespoke and uh, third, uh, third party software packages requiring variety of, uh, of niche skills. And that's very difficult to manage. Yeah? It's difficult to manage in terms of, uh, of planning. Um, the question is how to find the right skills at the right time in the right place. Uh, and that question is always uh, complex, but also how it evolves over time. Uh, and we shouldn't forget on top of that legacy uh, technology platforms today, they need to hire big data uh, SMEs, uh, AI, machine learning, who also uh, become uh, niche kind of skills. So skills is, uh, is a, a challenge that comes uh, most of the time in the discussions. And the last one is the uh, time to market. Uh, so again, because of that variety of systems, every new development needs months of uh, implementation in general, not in one system, but in a variety of systems to cover the end-to-end -end business process. And it needs to, to go through 
uh, you know, design, build, regression, testing, and then uh, rehearsal, and then going into production. Uh, and that dynamic, that stand, standard uh, project dynamic, actually is becoming more and more heavy. Uh, uh, different systems uh, uh, adopted different strategies uh, towards test automation and DevOps. So there's always one pieces in that end-to-end uh, -end chain where there's a bottleneck and there's a, a lack of ability to automate and to accelerate things. So some features or some regulations will require between upgrades and uh, you know lock projects probably seven, eight, nine, ten months before they become available uh, uh, for the business. But that's too long for any business case. Yeah, today I think bank they 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 need things to be done much quicker. So this is uh, in a summary the the key challenges we see with uh, with the banking system today. Yeah, thanks. And uh, yeah, you know, there, there's a lot of complex models at, at play here. So, um, you know, so you've, you've covered profitability, skills management, and time to market. In, in your view, how could banks address these challenges? So there's uh, different strategies, and we saw different uh, the initiatives. But this overarching the kind of idea that that is has been there actually since uh, since the beginning, but it's been explored with uh, with uh, different angles is about simplification. As a CIO, the question is, how can I simplify my uh, technology stack? And instead of having all those systems, to reduce them to uh, a lower number of, uh, of systems. The, uh, the benefit there are quite obvious. Yeah? So it's about reducing the number of platforms, cutting the underlying operations, infrastructure cost, uh, license uh, fees as well. Now, the challenge on simplification is on the execution, how to run it. Uh, without impacting the business. Uh, we shouldn't forget that those systems are being used every day by, by traders, by back office, by risk. So when we, we disrupt uh, that framework and we try to just replace or consolidate systems, there's, there's a side effect on, on the business and it needs to be measured and it's not easy all the time. So that's uh, some, you know, it, it's lower a bit those decisions and made the banks need, uh, think two or three times before they engage into that kind of, uh, of uh, uh, initiatives. Also, what's the business case? So what's the cost of uh, transformation versus the, the benefit from it and how to justify it? We are here in complex projects that in general, they tend to be a multi-year project. So how to make sure that uh, during four or five years, there's, uh, there's a business value. So there's no, uh, the business shouldn't wait five years in a big bank approach to, to get the first benefits and how to make it in a way where we can achieve incremental benefits uh, in a regular way uh, over time. And also in four or five years, and we, we saw it from 2007, eight, nine, and then, uh, you know, uh, and you had different episodes for the last uh, 10 years, strategies can change and the market can change uh, uh, in a shorter period than five years. So the bank also need to be able to have that uh, certainty that while going through those transformations, they can change the strategy, they can scale up, down, uh, uh, change the priorities, and then, uh, uh, but at the same time, without losing the, the money that is already invested. So, to, in other terms, they need to achieve business uh, benefit at every, at a regular basis, and then if they need to stop or to change the strategy, what was invested already shouldn't be th money thrown by the window. Yeah. It needs to be kept there and becomes the, the new legacy of the bank. So those those projects are uh, are quite uh, uh, complex and interesting. Now, as a side effect of those projects, we discuss, uh, you know, the different solutioning, so location strategy, offshore, uh, also DevOps, because that's it's, uh, or agile, that's a, a, a way on how to achieve iterative uh, uh, delivery uh, to business. Cloud came a bit at a later stage as uh, an enabler for uh, hardware provisioning, uh, et cetera. Uh, so all of those did contribute a bit to the success of, of those initiatives, but they didn't fully uh, resolve the, uh, the equation. Now, from that point, uh, that's what it becomes interesting. So uh, we see more and more uh, of our clients and different bands asking, okay, so now, so we're dealing with that complexity and all that technology stuff. So how about someone uh, like DLC Lightsoft will come here, uh, they become the, the main 
point of contact for, and they take that complexity under their umbrella. And instead of us as a bank owning the, uh, the technology and thinking about how to do it, et cetera. So we have someone, uh, a trusted partner who can take it. And then as a bank, we just consume it as a service. Uh, and that uh, notion dimension of consuming uh, uh, as a service instead of owning a platform is something that is not new. Uh, I mean, all of us saw it in, in, uh, in other industries, in retail banking or in, uh, like for example, Salesforce as a typical example. But again, on the capital market, because of the complexity and because of the interactions between the front office risk back and data and access to data, et cetera, so that it becomes complex. But we think today, is the uh, uh, all the ingredients and what we'll discuss a bit later also during this uh, session is why we think all the building blocks and the ingredients are uh, 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 available and ready to explore uh, you know using platform as a service yeah well, thanks then i think uh, you know there's definitely been, it's been a being a big drive the last few years to 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 move i guess transformational programs into a more agile like delivery like, like you mentioned to you know, to have that iterative and uh, intermediate, um, I guess, benefit delivery model that uh, that does has been proven to work to, to move away from sort of traditional delivery models, and um, you know that is obviously uh, would be a, a, a part of um, improving kind of um, delivery output. But you know, I think this you know, as a service is definitely gro you know growing and um, uh, and in sort of increasing adoption. So very interesting to hear your thoughts on that. I mean, I think you know in order to bring this. You know, bring this to uh, to the audience in a way that um, you know we can actually sort of try and sort of get across the benefits that they could actually for, you know actually um, get out of moving to as a service uh, and the many different ways in, in which that is that can be applied. You know, what are the what do you see are the key benefits in addressing you know the challenges in 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 using the as a service? Yeah, so I think the the, root, uh, uh, the main point to uh, to note here is what we're talking about here is the as a service notion. Some of the banks already do it in one way or the others, or they do parts of it. So this is not uh, a revolution in the way they treat uh, applications. And as a typical example today, when banks uh, and we we have many engagements like those ones to manage its service. So we have teams managing the run and change of a treasury or front to back uh, uh, activity from on-site or offshore, then there's different uh, uh, levels of that. And we can be working based on SLAs and in the complete autonomy from, uh, from the bank teams or in interacting, still interacting with the bank team. So we still, we already see benefits from that uh, kind of engagements in the sense the bank staff and the bank teams have more time available for them to focus on their business and to, uh, to to get less involved into the the complexity of the of the underlying stack. Yeah, what, what they're interested in is to have a front to back a solution that with, uh, with with one entry point where we can uh, consume uh, consume it as a service. So that's that's actually it's already in place. It's not something completely new. The 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 new thing or the uh, what's different in in there is the uh, the way it's structured actually i think the the ambition here is to to really free the bank completely from the burden and uh, from the heaviness of the uh, uh, of dealing with those platforms from not only from a run perspective but also from uh, from a maintenance from upgrading the systems uh, understanding uh, uh, you know, what's the dependency between the Java version, the Oracle version, and then what it means in terms of different software packages, which one needs to be upgraded to be compliant with this new technology, etc. Because today, while we run managed services, all that thinking process and the planning is happening on the bank side. So they still, at the CIO level, they're still uh, spending time and effort to try to, uh, to absorb and to, to understand the how the technologies are changing and how they need to plan their backlog uh, based on that. So the what we want today is to help them even more and push the, the notion of managed services even more and take that complexity on, uh, on our side. Uh, what will come with it as well is on the infrastructure. We, uh, we think that today all bands are ready uh, to cloud. We are not only talking about public cloud, it can be private cloud, uh, etc. So that needs to be encapsulated 
by default as part of that uh, uh, using the solution as a service. Uh, and it, it, this is something that will help, uh, you know, for example, for remote working, uh, we saw that during COVID and uh, that ability to, uh, uh, to open uh, access to the platform from different locations. Uh, so, so that's quite interesting and cloud will offer it uh, in, uh, in the native uh, in the native way the what's interesting also in that uh, solution is that it comes with um, um, the quicker time to market so as part of the solution there is um, an ability to push things into production in in a the, in the much quicker way simply because we will uh, integrate uh, automatically in it a ci cd Kind of process, yeah. So all the uh, all the the, dev, the DevOps tooling and the the test automation, uh, uh, to our experience and our partnership with different vendors, we already package those elements and they are uh, made available for the clients. And we know today, each time a bank try to establish, uh, let's say, a DevOps, for example, framework, or even if it's a test automation framework around complex front to risk to back office platforms the initial investment is quite uh, heavy, like going from nothing to, to a point where they can still do some uh, automation. That, that cost is quite expensive. So today with the solution as a service, actually we deliver it as part of the, of the service and, the, uh, uh, and it becomes part, uh, part of it. Another benefit is, uh, is the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the security level. Yeah, so the uh, security is very important, access to data is very important, and while this used to be a concern in the context of cloud, today is uh, probably uh, an advantage or a benefit because all cloud providers have built very strong uh, best practices around uh, access to, to data and security uh, layers, etc. So that helps, uh, you know, from a bank perspective, they already inherit that mature uh, layer of security. And uh, another benefit is data. Uh, so while today data is spread uh, among different systems uh, and it's difficult to generate end-to-end -end reports or to have it across the board uh, understanding of the business and dashboard that will help making decisions or understand the risk exposure. Uh, having that uh, concentrating all the platforms under a solution as a service, one provider delivering it as a platform as a service, uh, and concentrating all, all that data into uh, a kind of a unified uh, cloud uh, architecture helps uh, having a better access to the data with, uh, with a secure layer. So all of those uh, benefits, and there are other many, help actually reduce the cost, but not even that actually. And even uh, some of our clients say cost reduction is fine. It's not only about cost reduction, but also it's about cost transparency. So they know exactly what they're paying for. Uh, and the business change over time. So, uh, you know, we can, uh, the bank can go through projects where they need to increase the, the volume of hardware to absorb the dev and test environment. Uh, but during the day, there's some times in the day where there's uh, additional calculation power needed uh, to, to compute some reports. So having that uh, uh, transparency on the cost and where the money is, doing, uh, is going in terms of uh, consumption of data, of power, or of uh, uh, storage, uh, uh, or even in terms of backlog. Yeah, let's say if a bank is going through a, an IBOR project, for example, and they need to increase the, the staff by a certain number of people, uh, so we provide that flex up and down possibility. So and, and they get transparency for what they're uh, paid for. So those are yeah. the, uh, in a summary, actually the, the key benefits of that approach. Thanks. So so, uh, so if I could just encapsulate what you said, so it's around cost transparency, you know, the the provisioning of infrastructure that's easier, uh, obviously in uh, public or, or private cloud uh, solutions to spin up environments uh, rather than having to procure hardware and get them sort of racked and stacked in data centers. The scalability that where you can sort of add nodes to bring uh, availability to you know to like you said the, the flux of business flow during during a day, the data centralization, and then sort of bringing market leading standards to things like security. So uh, quite an encompassing sort of service overall, but um, I think, uh, you know, that's, you know, fantastic. Thanks, uh, Ian. So I think also, you know, we've got a question actually. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip to that now. Um, so this is actually just um, 
what, what, you know, what is the rough percentage of your software development efforts dependency, if any OSS driven stacks? And how do you see that from a risk or opportunities perspective? So the, um, so from out, so we work both with uh, software development and on, uh, on bespoke or third party uh, uh, applications. We think that uh, today on, uh, it's mainly driven by third party applications. So it's a, it's a lot of uh, configuration um, and it's quite standardized. It's more and more a standard, at least as soon as a transaction is put in the system. Uh, we may think that bespoke developments are, uh, are important to address different specific requirements for each bank, but actually the reality is, uh, whereas we're talking about an investment bank or a buy side or a sell side, the treasury or commodity products, the, when, when you look at it uh, at different layers uh, and you remove the pre-trade and, and the business related part, you know, all the post-trade life cycle is quite similar. So there's uh, a level of uh, 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 standardization that is quite uh, high and which increasing. So which makes the bespoke developments actually uh, uh, something still necessary, but will reduce over time. Okay. Um, and in fact, well, I, I've got a question I'd like to put in a, to, to you, which is, um, you know, just you know, thinking about our audience and anyone who, who um, you know, might be out there thinking about moving to, you know, as a service models, you know, in, in real world terms, um, uh, for anyone considering moving um, to as a, uh, as a service solution, what do you think, in your mind, are the key considerations um, to develop an informed position in, in adopting, you know, these services? Yeah. So while the, the target is the same, is uh, the, what, what we target we talked about here is for the CIO instead of dealing with the technology stack and the complexity, is to focus on innovation and then uh, making sure that the business has a screen login password they connect and they can run their business with someone providing that as a solution. So that's the target. So to, to achieve it, actually, what we see is different banks have different uh, different ways. Uh, I, I will say two examples. Uh, some some banks did invest dozens of billions in, in their existing platforms, and they want those platforms, the same platforms, to to become uh, as a service. So to find you know to how to host them allowed and how to make them uh, as a service, and why not share that share them with other banks to reduce the overall cost and talking about the multi-tenant kind of solution. Some other banks have a different strategy to say, okay, we keep our legacy platform now. We will create a new, fresh so, uh, uh, trading system as a service, but just for a new business line where we wanted to, uh, to cover certain areas uh, because there's a new area of business in the bank and we, we cannot wait you know, for the legacy system to nine, 10 months to go into production. We just want to start with a new, very fresh, uh, solution as a service platform, and then over time, in an agile mode, just integrate and migrate from the legacy system to that new solution as, as a service. So what, why I'm saying here this, I'm saying this to, to show that while we are having the same target, the, the execution path might differ from one bank to another based on their strategy. So what we say in general is very important for each bank to, de to decide of what their strategy, what, what they're trying to achieve uh, and from there we help them run that execution uh, um, path and that's important to allow them at any point of time to measure the success and have the benefit to the business yeah, so, it's, so it's important to have that as, a, as a, a consistent approach to say this is my target this is now how i want to achieve it and those are the key milestones and this is how we'll measure my my benefit at uh, at any point of time during my uh, transformation journey I think that's a very good point. You know, understanding your uh, target op operating model and you know what, what benefits you set out to achieve by doing this um, and having a clear, clear plan to to do that, and if it makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah. So, okay, thank you for that. I've um, got another question actually. Um, so the question is, from a data architecture perspective, do you foresee any issues uh, in general practice of logical separation of data for code tenants and databases? So that uh, it's a very important question, but and actually there are many. Uh, uh, I think we, the market in general, and uh, us specifically, we, we have become very mature to to how to deal with uh, that kind of uh, of matters. So in terms of uh, architecture, and that's helped also by the cloud solution, 
by also the way uh, third party uh, applications have evolved over the last five to, to 10 years. It makes it very uh, uh, much easier now to isolate or to segregate the data between uh, different uh, different bands or different parties. So we used to, to before, you know, there's the notion of Chinese walls, etc. I think all of that today is, is evolving a bit. And what we recommend in, uh, in general is to have a pragmatic approach to it. Uh, most of the times what we see in the reality, there's 90% of the cases that can be easily covered by from an architectural perspective and by leveraging some of the uh, of the uh, native functionalities of cloud and of what the third party vendors did in their own system. But probably there's a five to 10% gap or areas that, that still not completely cannot be isolated. There's also other mechanism. Uh, all of us know uh, people who did deliver technology projects. There's some naming, naming conventions, uh, dealing with access rights and doing the right governance in terms of uh, accessing to the data and then approving the data, etc. So that's uh, instead of waiting additional three, four years until that 10% gap is covered by the native technologies, I think we, we still have those uh, uh, solutions actually to, uh, to approach it in a pragmatic way. But today we have very good examples on the market uh, of uh, uh, shared uh, platforms and multi-tenants. Uh, if I look uh, a bit more in the Nordics uh, area, for example, there's, uh, we have uh, examples of uh, you know, uh, 17 to 20 banks are working on, on, on the same platforms uh, covering front to risk to back. So that's uh, that's feasible from that perspective. Okay. Um, well, I think, you know, thank you very much, Yadin. I think that's been, uh, you know, fantastic chat um, with you for the for the last half an hour and, and very insightful uh, into the world of as a service. Um, I, I think our time is up, unfortunately. Um, and so at this point, um, I'm going to hand back to Emmanuel for today's closing remarks. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ian.